For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomolegai. Author Patrick Tariq Millay joins me to unpack his book titled The Truth About Cape Slavery, The Foundations of Colonial South Africa. Slavery in South Africa was a key part of the colony's economy and society from the 1650s until the 1830s. So Tariq, why do you think the history of slavery is somewhat forgotten? I think it's been suppressed over the years. It wasn't part of uh, school histories. Um, it wasn't talked about in the public space. And um, for very good reason, from the colonialist point of view, because it challenges all of the mythologies of um, colonial development. Without enslavement, there would have been no colonial development. You know, we have... Um, a prominent politician, Helen Ziller, who very often publicly says, we owe everything to colonialism. We wouldn't have piped water. We wouldn't have roads. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, all the modern conveniences if it wasn't for the colonials. But we know that whereas there was only 1% skilled artisans from amongst the Europeans for almost 150 years, there was over 25% skilled artisans from amongst the enslaved. And that, in fact, much of the development, whether farming development, whether building towns, whether building the cities, the roads, the infrastructure, was done by enslaved people um, who were both skilled and were labor, hard labor. And that truth, you know, my book is entitled The Truth About Cape Slavery. That truth has been hidden because we have told that we owe everything to the European colonists. And talk to us more on why was slavery instituted at the Cape? You know, when, when the Dutch decided to establish a refreshment station for their shipping to the east, firstly, they needed to be able to have farms that would produce the vegetables and so on for the passing ships. And um, they tried to use white labor, but they could not attract. They even gave free aided immigration packages to Europeans to come. But those that came proved, and, and there are plenty of documentation to show this, proved that they were actually lazy. They couldn't, they couldn't take the hard work. And then others didn't come because they just feared coming to Africa. And so the, the, the Dutch were compelled that if they were going to make a success of this colony, they would have to get the labor from somewhere. So they turned to other African countries and they turned to India and they turned to Southeast Asia and they captured people and they brought them here to work forcibly without any compensation and under extremely cruel conditions. So it was vital for the development of this colony to have this huge labor force that was free we, we often talk about the expropriation of land without compensation, but there was also expropriation of labor without compensation. And also, Tariq, why do you argue that slavery at the Cape was mild and benevolent compared to the slavery in the Americas? Now, I actually argue the opposite. <laughs> I, I, I argue that, you know, we are told by the colonialists that slavery was mild and it was benevolent at the Cape. Everything shows that it was not mild and benevolent and that it was equally bad as in the Americas. And we just have to look at the punishment regimen that existed. We had crucifixions in the Cape for over 120 years. We had decapitations. We had a burning at the stake. We had drownings, garroting, floggings. We had scenarios where the enslaved were the longest to have to carry passes and um, they had to carry a button sewn onto their tunics. If they ran away, they had their ears cut off or their nose cut off. This is not benevolent and mild enslavement. This is really vicious and cruel. And then we look at the fact that what we had was what is called chattel slavery. In other words, the enslaved were investments by the colonists. They could be bought, sold, they could be bartered, traded, they could be um, even won in a lottery. Um, you could have timeshare on enslaved people. 
all of these features were the same features that were in the Americas. So there wasn't any mild enslavement at the Cape. It also ultimately wasn't just restricted to the Cape because slavery through the Great Trek was taken to the Free State, it was taken to the Transvaal Republic, it was taken to Natalia. So the entire South Africa ended up having some form of slavery or another within it. And we're talking about a huge number of people. The first generation enslaved were around about 70,000 people who survived. About 120,000 were brought here, but many, many died at sea, the long and horrible voyage packed into these ships. The survivors, about 70,000, and those survivors had children and grandchildren who were also enslaved. So we, when we really take the entire figure, it's about 200,000 people that were you know, bought, sold, and, and exploited for their labor. Certainly not a mild system. And what motivated you to write this book? Also, can you narrate to us how slavery affected the economy in the Cape? You know, I often tell people the story about when I was a child of eight years old, I had a single mother. We were very poor, and she worked in a laundry in District 6. And um, she couldn't always take me with her to work, so other people would look after me. And there was a nun up the road who used to take me. And one day I was watching this nun. She was praying at the statue of a black man. Now, for a young child to see uh, a white lady on her knees talking to a long dead black man and asking for help was quite an experience. And she explained to me that his mother had been an enslaved African woman and his father was Spanish. And she told me that our people in District 6, you know, colored people, are descendants of enslaved people as, as well. And from eight years old, I had this magnificent obsession about the subject. And in the process, I found that there were 26 people in my family tree who were enslaved from other parts of Africa, from Asia and India and Southeast Asia. And so it became very personal, discovering my roots, my family tree, and also discovering what my people had gone through before me. And our family under apartheid, we were classified as what is called other coloreds. You know, there, there were actually seven categories of colors. <laughs> Many people, younger people don't know that. And um, uh, my two grandmothers, one was a colored descendant from enslaved, and the other one was um, descendant from the Damascus Khoi people. And they were married to Europeans, and hence, you know, we have this mixed family. So it was a, a personal journey, not just an academic journey, and a journey to try and understand why our people are unemployed, why our people are living in backyards and not having proper homes and being exploited on farms. And all of this is answered by the subject of enslavement, of how people were treated in the past that has now made our future. And I always say to people, when we talk about looking at the past, it's about being able to know where you come from so that you can know where you want to go. If you if you do not know who you are and where you come from, how can you how can you actually plot your way forward in life and create a future? And I also use a, a particular phrase. I talk about that without restorative memory, you cannot craft restorative justice because the one is what gives birth to the other. By remembering what happened, you need to be able to say, okay, now I can know what I need to change to make things better. And Tariq, you demonstrate that the Netherlands government's apology for slavery was defiant in that descendants of the Africa-Asian enslaved and the Cape indigenous Africans were insulted and angered by its witness. Can you tell us more on this? Yes, what, what had happened was, in fact, my book, the first five chapters or so, was a direct response to what I called a non-apology by the Dutch king. The Dutch king, you know, about 18 months, two years ago, came out and said that he wanted to apologize for the role of the Dutch in slavery. But when he explained his apology, he was mainly talking about two places in the Caribbean and the Atlantic enslaved trade. He didn't touch on the Indian Ocean enslaved trade, which was mainly driven by the Dutch, 
nor did it touch on South Africa, which was primarily driven by the Dutch. And so for us, it was a kind of non-apology. He didn't seem to know what he was apologizing for. So I began to write the book to provide him, and I did. I gave it to the, the Netherlands embassy for the Dutch king and said, this is what you should be apologizing for. But this is not what we've heard you apologizing for. And likewise with the British. The Dutch and the British are the prime culprits for enslavement at the Cape. The enslavement in the Indian Ocean arena is about 4 million people. Because people weren't only taken to the Americas, they were also taken to destinations across the Indian Ocean arena at the Cape, but also across India, across Southeast Asia, right through to China and Japan and the Philippines. And there was over 47 Dutch factories, plantations, and settlements and forts where enslaved people were used to basically build the wealth of Europe. Europe is wealthy today because of slavery yesterday. Europe came out of the dark ages. It was in a mess before they went out and they started capturing slaves. So the whole issue here of, you know, a man by the name of Walter Rodney wrote a book back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and he was assassinated, I think, largely because of this book. And the book was entitled How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And if you flip that around, it really means how Africa actually developed Europe. And this is what it's the story of enslavement is all about, that the resources, including the human resources of Africa and Asia, the global south, was used to build the global north. And to this day, we suffer for it. And so it's important for us to understand this aspect of history, to be able to understand what's happening right now. And for instance, we see the Europeans still at it in Palestine. The Palestinians are actually colonized by Europeans, and the Europeans are prepared to slaughter them so that they can get what they want. And there are economic reasons why they want Gaza flattened and so on. So the story continues. It, sometimes people keep telling us, forget the past. You can't forget the past because the past is the present. You know, if we look at our country, the vast majority, 30 years after liberation, the vast majority of people are poor still and have no hope. That's our biggest issue in South Africa, no hope. 60% of young people, no jobs. So it is now, it's not just in the past. And lastly, Tariq, what are you hoping to achieve with this book? Consciousness. Um, it's about, you know, I talked about how I came to a a consciousness over my youth and, and so on, which set me on a path of struggle throughout my whole life. Ended up in exile for 14 years, worked in the underground, took up arms against the system and so on. But that consciousness I want to share with others, particularly younger generations, asking questions as to why. Why do we have this position in life? If we don't understand why, we're not going to be able to get out of it. We're not going to fight it. My book is about building consciousness. It's also about addressing issues of identity. You know, over a quarter of South Africans have ancestors who were enslaved, not just colored people. People in, in, who were classified black, people who were classified Indian, even some were classified white. They have ancestry, roots in enslavement, but they don't know. And if we say we revere our ancestors and we, we pay tribute to our ancestors, but we don't know who they are and we don't know what they endured and experienced, then it's nonsense. So I want to conscientize people to understand what their ancestry is, why they are economically in the position that they're in, and how by having this conversation we could actually change the social and economic fortunes of the vast majority of our people today. That was Patrick Tariq Malay speaking to Krima Media's Polity about the truth about Cape Slavery, Foundations of Colonial South Africa.